If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. This is Larry Wessels, director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian Debater. I wanted to take time to give a tribute to my pastor of 30 years, Pastor Jackson Boyette. The picture you're looking at is me with Pastor Boyette right after my baptism in a creek in Austin. That was some cold creek water. My pastor and his wife, Barbara, were called home to be with the Lord in a traffic accident on November 29th. 2011. Details of the accident can be found at various internet resources. Quote, we just hope the Lord takes us together, end quote, Jackson and Barbara used to say, and the Lord has granted their request. Psalm 116.15 says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Jackson Boyette was born in Austin in 1947 to Ernest and Sylvia Boyette. At the age of five, Jackson's family moved to Telegraph, Texas, population 25, 16 miles south of Junction. Jackson grew up there, attending a Southern Baptist church, where at the age of nine, he was converted to Christ. He later graduated from nearby Junction High School and then came back to Austin to attend the University of Texas. While at UT and afterwards, he attended an Assemblies of God church. Earning a B.A. in English, he became an English teacher at Dell Valley High School between 1970 and 1973. During this time, he married his college sweetheart, Barbara Buis, uh, from Arlington, Texas. After feeling a call of the Lord to the ministry in 1973, Jackson enrolled in the Austin Presbyterian Seminary, where he earned a Master of Divinity degree by 1976. At that same time, he was licensed and later ordained 1977 by the Assemblies of God. Between 1976 and 1978, he worked in the Teen Challenge Organization, a ministry to help young people, and became director of Austin Teen Challenge. At the end of 1978, he left the Assemblies of God and Teen Challenge, however, because of doctrinal differences over the baptism in the Holy Spirit and the initial physical evidence of speaking in tongues. After that, he began pastoring a non-denominational, independent church, then meeting at the American Legion Hall just off of Mopac and Lake Austin Boulevard called Dayspring Fellowship. His duties included teaching Sunday school at 9.30 and conducting regular Sunday morning services at 10.30. Jackson also held a Sunday night Bible study at his home and a Wednesday night theology class at different members' homes. Besides much personal counseling throughout the week, he occasionally taught basic theology at Hill Country Faith Ministries Bible College in San Marcos. Jackson's radio career began at the age of eight when he hosted a kiddie program every Saturday afternoon on a junction radio station. In 1977, George Carey of KGTN, a Christian FM station in Georgetown, asked him to work for him. Carey had learned of Jackson's previous radio experience from Stu Slim, operator of Ministries for Christ bookstore. Jackson accepted the position. Soon after this, David Jones, then program director of KIXL Radio, heard Jackson on KGTN and hired him away. Jackson did a talk show called Interview for two months on KIXL before the station was sold and the staff, including Jackson, was fired wholesale. However, one month later, KIXL hired him back to do the interview show at 2 o'clock and play Christian music from 3 to 6 each evening. He was later promoted to program director, and he continued to work there until 1979. During 1979, he made the decision to resign so he could devote himself to full-time pastoring. His 
Absence from KIXL was short-lived. Jackson returned in January of 1981 after Gene Bender, the station's general manager, asked him to come back. Jackson's afternoon program remained for the next three years until he decided once again to devote himself to full-time ministry of his growing church. Pastor Boyette reflects, I have worked at KIXL on three separate occasions and I have never applied to work there. I was sought out and asked to work. The Lord simply wanted me to work there, end quote. Jackson's church, Spring Fellowship, officially began in September 1978 with about 20 members. The church had evolved from a Friday night Bible study to a more conventional Sunday morning gathering and worship service. Spring, a King James Version term meaning sunrise, mentioned in Luke chapter 1, verse 78, patterns itself after Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Throughout the years, Pastor Boyette assisted me in the production of various videos for Austin's Cable Access TV. Here's a few samples. These shows can be found on YouTube. Type Jackson Boyette in the YouTube search box. Here's a clip from Jackson's rendition video of Jonathan Edwards' famous sermon, Sinners, in the hands of an angry God. It is widely recognized that America's greatest philosopher theologian was Jonathan Edwards, who lived in the 18th century from 1703 to 1758. He was a remarkable minister as well as a theologian, and he preached the most famous sermon to ever be preached in America. It's one of the very few sermons that has found its way into books of literature. Many college students will recall reading it in their American literature anthologies. It's called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. The infinite might and majesty and terribleness of the omnipotent God shall be magnified upon you in the ineffable strength of your torments. You shall be tormented in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And when you shall be in this state of suffering, the glorious inhabitants of heaven shall go forth and look on the awful spectacle that they may see what the wrath and fierceness of the Almighty is. And when they have seen it, they will fall down and adore that great power and majesty. And it shall come to pass, says Isaiah, that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. Isaiah 66, 23 and 24. Here's Jackson doing his rendition of a famous sermon by Charles Haddon Spurgeon. The title of this video is called All Time Famous Sermons. The Hairs on Your Head Numbered by Charles Haddon Spurgeon, circa 1888. One of the greatest preachers who ever lived was Charles Haddon Spurgeon, born in 1834 and who died in 1892. For 38 years, he pastored a church in London known as the Metropolitan Tabernacle. It was an amazing pastorate. And he was certainly the most popular preacher in London in an era when there were many popular preachers. His popularity can be attested by many statistics, but probably the most amazing one is this. The Metropolitan Tabernacle held 6,000 people. And four times a year, once a quarter, the actual congregation, the actual church members, were asked to stay home one Sunday evening per quarter so that visitors could come here, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, and they still had a full house with none of the members present. So that gives you some indication of the incredible popularity of this man. His, preach, his preaching has been uh, an enormous blessing through the medium of the printed word throughout the last century, and uh, many of his books still remain in print. Not only the man, 
but all that concerns the man is foreordained of the Lord. The very hairs of your head, that is to say, all that which has anything to do with you, which comes into any kind of contact with you, and is in any sense part and parcel of yourself, is under the divine foresight and predestination. Everything is in the divine purpose and has been ordered by the divine wisdom. All the events of your life, the greater certainly, the smaller with equal certainty. It is impossible to draw a line in providence and say this is arranged by providence and that is not. It must take everything in its sweep. All that happens, it determines not only the movement of a star but the very nature of the blowing of a grain of dust along a public road. All this from the very nature of the thing is clear. God's providence knows nothing of the things so little as to be beneath its notice, nothing of things so great as to be beyond its control. Nothing is too little or too great for God to rule and overrule. This Jackson video is from Studies of Ephesians, number four. God knows all, justification, faith is believing to the point of total trust. Hello, I'm Jackson Boyette. I'm glad you're able to join me for this program. It's called Understanding Your Bible. And I'm the pastor of a church that does a lot of Bible study, Spring Chapel, a Reformed Baptist church in Austin at 55th and Avenue G, just two blocks south of Keenig Lane. This program is designed for people who uh, perhaps don't know a whole lot about the Bible, people who have not been to church in a long time, or who have not read the Bible for a long time, or who have never read the Bible. But perhaps you have a copy there where you live, and you might like to go get it now, because this program is very much like any sort of instructional program, uh, say a cooking program or an aerobics program. It's designed for your interaction, and so let me just encourage you to go find that Bible, maybe one that was given to you as a gift, one that you've intended to read and kept for a number of years now and would really like to know more about. When you get it, bring it in and uh, sit down in front of the television and turn to the book of Ephesians. While you're finding Ephesians, which is over in the New Testament, past Romans and 1st and 2nd Corinthians and Galatians. This Jackson video is called Health and Wealth Gospel, number five, negating positive confession. And this video deals with the false TV preachers that are everywhere to be found. Hello and welcome. I'm Jackson Boyette, the pastor of Dayspring Fellowship, a Reformed and Baptist church in the city of Austin, Texas. And we're very glad that you have joined us for this very special program today. I have a very special guest. He is the editor of an exciting book that came out uh, last year. It's called The Agony of Deceit, What Some TV Preachers are really teaching. And obviously, since I'm a TV preacher myself, I'm going to be very interested in seeing what our guest says about uh, this particular uh, subject. And if those of you who are watching this program watch other programs, you already may have an idea of what some TV preachers are really teaching. My guest today is the pastor of a Reformed Episcopal Church out in Anaheim, California, Mr. Michael Horton. Michael, good to have you with us. Thanks a lot, Pastor. Good to be with you. I'm going to try to explain uh, with uh, a, an oral illustration here why we're doing this program. If a picture is worth a thousand words, these excerpts are probably worth a million. Let's, uh, l let me push the right button here and uh, you can get some sort of idea as to why we're going to take up the next hour of your time. If you need some money, I wouldn't change that dial. Jesus had a nice house, a big house. When I read in the Bible where he says, I am, I just smile and say, yes, I am too. Jesus wore designer clothes. Jesus was handling big money. Not only is wearing a sin, but being poor is a sin when God promises prosperity. You don't have a God in you, you are one. 
you don't have a God in you, you are one. Now, if you just hear that out of the context, if you're not involved in the ebb and the rhythm and all of that that the TV preachers stir up, and you're not uh, in the whole emotional atmosphere that is created by their television and radio programs, that statement ought to scare you a little bit if you have any hint of Christianity about you at all. That you are a God. Now, everybody who has any experience with Christianity should know instinctively that that statement is a lie, and yet that is exactly what's being taught by many of the TV preachers. This Jackson sermon is found on Demonic Possession Case, Dealing with the Devil, What Jesus Has Done to Satan. Let's just look at what happens in heaven now in verse 7. And there was war in heaven. This war comes after the ascension. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Do you see what happened when, the, when Jesus came, and he, and he ascended into heaven? You remember how in the old western movies a cowboy would come into town and say to the bad guy, this town's not big enough for both of us? Well, Jesus went to heaven, and heaven was not big enough for both him and Satan. According to the uh, ninth chapter of Hebrews, to which we need not turn at the moment, he purified the heavenly places themselves with his blood. He purified the heavenly sanctuary with his blood. And he cast Satan out of heaven. So this is when Satan was actually cast out of heaven. It was not some time before um, the uh, advent of man on the earth in the book of Genesis. It happened after the ascension of the Lord Jesus. He was cast out into the earth and his angels, those stars of verse 4, were cast out with him. Now look at verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused, past tense, notice the past tense, which accused them before our God day and night. Christians operate as if it said accuses, but it says accused. He no longer has access to the throne of God to accuse you before God. The popular picture of Satan playing the prosecuting attorney and Jesus playing the defense attorney before God is totally unscriptural. Satan's not even there anymore. He, the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death, Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. This Jackson video is called The Jehovah's Witnesses' Fraudulent Bible, Evaluating the New World Translation, Verse by Verse. Well, we have uh, many slides that are going to be incorporated here to facilitate this, this analysis. Uh, so we bring up the first slide, uh, which will show the title of our show, Evaluating the New, there it is, Evaluating the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. This is published by the Watchtower Bible Tract Society, uh, better known as the Jehovah's Witnesses. If we go to the next slide, please. Uh, that's a better look at how their translation appears, a uh, New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. And we're going to analyze if this is a good, readable, uh, trustworthy translation. And uh, our, our, so I guess I could say our panel of experts here, <laughs> uh, we're going to take a look at this and, and see from a biblical perspective uh, and from uh, the original languages of the Greek if this can be determined. Okay, if we can go to our next slide, uh, we'll basically be using 
a uh, companion volume that the Watchtower Bi Bible and Tract Society has come out with, the Kingdom Interlinear Translation of the Greek Scriptures. And what they've done here is they've published a Westcott and Hort. I think uh, we can go to the next slide and, and maybe demonstrate this a little bit. Uh, maybe a little harder to read there, but uh, those arrows point out that we've got a Greek text which uh, reads across the top uh, from a Westcott and Hort Greek text. Uh, here we find Jackson hosting the video, Is the Church of Christ Denomination a Religious Cult? Hello and welcome to Dayspring Evangelism Presents. I'm Jackson Boyette, pastor of Dayspring Fellowship, a Reformed Baptist Church in Austin, and this is the program that is sponsored by our Evangelism Committee at our church. Joining me today on this program is Mr. Bob L. Ross, the Director of Pilgrim Publications in Pasadena, Texas, and our evangelist at Dayspring Fellowship, Larry Wessels, who is the Director of Dayspring Evangelism. The purpose of this program today is to talk about some recent debates and uh, uh, recent programs that have been aired concerning the so-called Churches of Christ. And we want to talk to Mr. Ross and Mr. Wessels because both of these men have been very active in scripturally opposing the Churches of Christ. Mr. Ross, for example, has written three books about the Church of Christ movement. The first one is called Campbellism, Its History and Heresies. The second one is a study of one of the favorite passages of the Churches of Christ, Acts 2.38 and Baptismal Remission. And then his most recent book on the Church of Christ movement is entitled The Restoration Movement. The cover of this one is particularly interesting because it shows a snake with rattles in his tail that say H, B, R, C, and B. And uh, those stand for hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. This man is uh, one who has been asked many times to debate Church of Christ ministers. He has never been spoiling for a fight himself. He has never initiated any of these debates. But he himself has been asked to debate a number of times. And over the years, there have been uh, Church of Christ ministers and Church of Christ people who have left this movement and have believed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, it's a real pleasure to welcome to our program these two men, so let's greet each of them first, and then we want to ask some questions about uh, the recent events. Mr. Ross, welcome back to our program. I'm glad to be here. Thanks. And Larry Wessels, welcome back. This is your program, and here I am hosting it and, uh, and acting as if you're a guest, and in actual fact, you're responsible for this program and our evangelism ministry, and it's good to be with you. Right, it's good to have you here, Pastor. It's always a, a, a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you very much. This video with Jackson is called Analysis of the United Pentecostal Church, an early 1900s anti-Trinitarian and baptism cult. This program before in connection with debating the Churches of Christ ministers recently and talking about the doctrines of Campbellism. And it's good to have you on this program to talk about the Trinity, Bob. Well, I'm glad to be here, brother. And we also have with us uh, Mark McNeil. Uh, Mark is from Houston. He is a recent graduate of Texas Bible College and he was valedictorian of his class. Now what's interesting about that is that uh, Mark was a member of the United Pentecostal Church. Texas Bible College is a United Pentecostal College and both this denomination and this school emphatically denies the Trinity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that the Bible speaks of. So Mark McNeil uh, is a convert to Trinitarianism. Uh, he has studied under some of the best people who energetically uh, deny the doctrine of the Trinity, and he's going to talk to us about that. Mark, I want to begin with you today because um, there may be some of our listeners out there uh, who don't even realize that there are professing Christians who deny the Trinity. They may uh, feel like that Trinitarianism is just such a foregone 
uh, conclusion or such an integral part of historic Christianity that they may be shocked to know that there are Christians who call themselves oneness people who deny the doctrine of the Trinity. This is a photo of Jackson's church at the Old American Legion Hall in Austin, Texas in 1983. I took the picture. The following is one of five videos in this tribute series to my pastor of 30 years. I look forward to seeing him and his wife Barbara again someday in the providence of God. But Titus 2, 11 through 14 is the one that the elders remember is Jackson's favorite verse. For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. John 14, 1 through 3. Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And Romans 35 through 39, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? That's a beautiful passage. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 19 through 22. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all of people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by man came death, by man came also the resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Revelation 21, 1 through 7. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city in New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor any pain anymore for the former things have all passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage. And I will be his God. And he will be my son. Praise the Lord. Our next hymn is Rock of Ages. Now the tune that we're going to sing it to is different from the traditional tune. Jackson requested that it be sung to the tune Redhead. Uh, if you know the hymn Till He Come, it's the same tune.
I've entitled this section, Remembering Barbara and Jackson. Uh, Jackson was born in Austin on July the 5th, 1947, the son of Ernest Jackson Boyette Sr. and Sylvia Bolt Boyette of Junction, Texas. Barbara was born in Angleton. I understand that she was actually born in somewhere else, but she lived in Angleton. On March 20th, 1947, and was the daughter of Reed Bias and Aline Whitaker Bias of Angleton, Texas. This is remembering Barbara and Jackson. So if I seem to sway from this solemn moment, I have to interject here. The Roman Catholics have their perpetual version. We had our everlasting 39-year-old. So Barbara was born in 1947, but when she died, she was 39. The age at which Jackson married her keeps going down and down and down as, as we went through the various birthdays. They were both graduates of the University of Texas in English literature. Jackson graduated with a Master of Divinity degree from Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminary in 1976. And after working at a variety of ministries, they founded uh, Day Spring Fellowship. Uh, it was a Bible study that grew into Day Spring Fellowship located at 5500 Avenue G in Austin. Jackson was also a friend, a counselor, a teacher, and the former chairman of the board of Two Every Tribe Ministries in Los Fresnos, Texas, and a board member of Providence Theological Seminary in Colorado Springs, Colorado. He and Barbara were both active in the Right to Life movement in Austin. They loved their Lord Jesus Christ. They loved Day Spring Fellowship, and they loved Texas, especially Austin. Jackson's father had served for a time as a personal secretary to Governor Coke Stevenson as sergeant at arms in the House of Representatives. Jackson is survived by his stepmother, Frances Boyette of Austin, a stepbrother, Ben Lindsay, and family of Austin, Trent Wilson and family, Danny Bolt and family, Carolyn Bolt Moore and family, Buddy Bolt family, and his cousins. They were all his cousins and all of Junction. Barbara is survived by her brother, Kenneth B. Logan of Portland, Oregon, her cousins, Shirley Miller, Shirley Miller of Alpharetta, Georgia, Gwen Howard of Shreveport, Louisiana, Dorothea Legrone of Carthage, Karen Simpson of Naples, Florida, Lanny Latil of Beaumont, Texas, Linda Holbrook of Lake Charles, Louisiana, and Jean Adams of Tyler, Texas, and a cousin we didn't realize Barbara had, and Barbara didn't remember or hadn't been able to get a hold of her for about 40 years. Darlene Hall of, Spring, of uh, Blue Springs, Missouri is here with us today, and she and Barbara had just recently reconnected with each other by phone. We would be remiss not to mention the cats, Sophie, Phoebe, and Zachary. As I said, we, we're calling this part Remembering Barbara and Jackson. And Barbara and I have many happy memories of our friends and our family, and they were like family to us. Um, as I thought about this day and this event, I knew it was difficult it was going to be for all of us, especially us. I want to tell you something about them that you probably already know if you're a day springer, but you might not know if you haven't seen them in a while. For all, I call these things now boyettisms, and for all of his learning, his polish, and his style, Jackson was at heart a telegraph boy. Now, if you don't know anything about Texas, I don't even know how to say this, but there's a cowboy culture that starts somewhere south of Austin and west of Austin, and it kind of sweeps across the state after that. And, and Jackson had his feet firmly planted in that cowboy culture. Because he, he very seldom admitted to a mistake, but one of my favorite sayings that he had when he did admit to a mistake was, you know, that horse hadn't drug me 30 feet before I knew I'd made a mistake. And the other one that I really will remember always is whenever he got surprised by something he wasn't expecting, you know, he, he, he would be talking, he'd tell him something, he would put his hand over his mouth, and he'd say, oh, my socks and shoes. <laughs> now, Barbara is almost indefinable. I think all of you that knew her well will agree. She was a beautiful woman. She was a wonderful cook. She was Jackson's anchor. Uh, without Barbara... I don't think we would have been anywhere near where we are today. 
But in one of our early dinners at their house, uh, Barbara had fixed one of her great meals that she always fixed. <laughs> the table was perfect, the silver was polished, and all the fine china and everything else, and only a meal like Barbara could prepare. You know, everything special in its own serving dishes and all this kind of stuff. And we'd just gotten started in the meal, and Jackson jumps up and he runs back into the pantry and he comes back out with a box of oyster crackers. And Barbara looks at him, and the only way, <laughs> the only way that she's the only one could say it like this, she said, Jackson, you're spoiling my tea party. <laughs> I've never known anyone like them whose hearts and home we're open to everyone, and especially all cats. <laughs> Whoever you were, you were welcome in their home. They lived a truly Christian life and were a model for us all, and they will not be forgotten. Our sermon today comes from Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. Second chapter, verses 1 through 10. This was Jackson's favorite verse. <laughs> Let us listen to the word of God. And you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now is at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead and our trespasses made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Jackson and I always had an understanding. In our earlier years, it was partly in jest, and then we nevertheless were serious about it, that whichever one of us died first, the other one had to preach his funeral. And I always prayed and hoped that it would be the other way around and he would have to preach my funeral. The Lord, however, has his own way, and it's perfect. And so we are gathered here today to remember our dear brother and sister. The Lord answered a consistent prayer that Barbara and Jackson had, and that was that if they had to go, they wanted to go together. That prayer was answered. Back in 1976, Jackson and Barbara were getting ready to fly to London to celebrate their 25th anniversary. They would have been married 40 years, the 18th of this month. It was a sealed envelope, and on the outside it said, to be open in the event of our deaths, because Jackson knew that sometimes airplanes fall out of the sky. And they went to England, and they celebrated their wedding anniversary in England, and I, I never opened that envelope until just a few days ago. And he left the message for you. Here's what he wanted me to tell you, Dayspring. Tell everyone at Dayspring how much we love them. Don't let them abandon the gospel. Make sure that whoever succeeds me loves people and will constantly remind them of our loving, gracious, invincible God. Don't let them abandon the gospel. So that's my desire this morning to preach once again that glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, that gospel that Jackson and Barbara clung so closely to. 
The Apostle Paul was a brilliant man. I heard someone once say, I think it was R.C. Sproul, once said that they have calculated that if the Apostle Paul were living today, he would have had two PhDs by the time he was 25 years old. But like all the other writers of scripture, we believe that he wrote under the influence of the Holy Spirit so that what he wrote was divinely inspired. Paul has some difficult things to say to us, but he also has some glorious things to say to us. And they're both found in these 10 short verses. If you're going to preach, you want to find a, a good condensation of the gospel from beginning to end, look to Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. In verses 1 through 3, Paul describes our condition apart from God, apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, what theologians sometimes refer to as what we are by nature. Now, the title of this sermon is the Ordo Salutis. I threw that in there just so Jackson would know I hadn't forgotten some of my theological terms. What it means is that we are humans. Now, what Paul says here applies to all humans without exception. In our culture, as in others, there are laws, and these laws vary in terms of the kind of level of punishment for any particular violation. Someone who steals a car is not punished uh, under the same level of intensity as someone who commits murder and so on. But with God, any sin and all sin condemns us to eternal punishment and separation from him. Now, the main reason for this is because not of, you know, of who we are, but of his holiness. God is not that gray-haired, grandfatherly type depicted by Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel and in most of our cultural accounts of him. God is a pure spirit. And he knows everything. And he sees everything. He is present at all times and at all places. He is glorious above glory. There is no other being as glorious as he is. And his purity and his holiness will not allow sin in his presence. It cannot. Because then it would reduce his holiness. And sully his holiness. Now in Ephesians, Paul is writing to Christians, to believers, but he wants them to remember what they were before they were Christians, before they were converted and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at how he describes them, and let me stress here that Paul is talking about everyone. No one is exempt from what he writes here. We were dead in trespasses and sins. We were following the course of this world. <clears throat> we were following the prince of the power of the air. And in case you don't know, <clears throat> that is Satan. Paul describes him as that spirit who is now at work in the sons of disobedience. There really is, brothers and sisters, a purely evil being, a fallen angel, who, as Scripture teaches, goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And Paul here calls him the prince of the power of the air. He's located here. Now, Paul includes himself <clears throat> in his description of that crowd. He starts with you, and then he switches to we. Some of you may not know that Paul considered himself to be the chief of sinners. I disagree with him on that point. I think I hold that position, but nevertheless, I can't argue with an apostle. Now, this is not Paul mocking unbelievers or pointing his finger at them and sneering at them. He's saying this is who we were before something really big happened. Now, here is the issue with these verses, as I see them. The person who doesn't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and hasn't experienced the transformation that he brings to believers cannot understand that they fit the picture of the first three verses. Because we see it in hindsight. It is after you become a Christian that you look back on your life. It is after the Holy Spirit begins that work in your heart and in your mind and your soul. And according to the Ordo Salutis, he begins it secretly at first before we're even aware. It is after he has done all of that and after we, our eyes have been opened, so to speak, that we begin to understand what we were. But when you're in the midst of that, you look around and you say, well, I don't, you know, what's the big deal? 
People just don't understand this and they can't see it. They will think or say things like, well, I'm not perfect, you know, but I'm no worse than the next man or woman and better than a lot of them. I don't cheat on my taxes. I pay my bills. I support my family. I don't get drunk. I don't mistreat my family. I'm putting aside funds for the future. I vote. Brothers and sisters, there's nothing particularly wrong with any of those things, but they don't solve our problem. You see, Paul says that we were dead in trespasses and sins. Paul isn't talking about these things of, you know, we talk about in the culture about being a good person. What Paul is saying is we were dead spiritually. We were separated from Christ with no hope for eternal life. There is such a thing as eternal life. We will live after these lives in one of two places, heaven or hell. That's what scripture teaches, and, and Jackson was a Calvinist like I am, and we believe that the scriptures are true, that the words of scriptures actually mean what they say, that it really is a book of truth. And if you want to know what, how things are going to be, then here's where you go. If you want to know how you ought to live, here's where you go. If you want to know who to believe in, here's where you go. We do not have, you know, we don't have the ability to work our way out of that. The, the culture tells us when we begin to think that we may be in some kind of a not-so-good situation that what we need is to lose some weight, join a yoga class, read a self-help book, or maybe even go to church. Brothers, that, that doesn't work. When you're dead in trespasses and sins, you don't have the ability to work our way out of that any more than you can make yourself taller or shorter or change the color of our eyes. Something or someone greater than we are must do something for us. Look at verse 4. In my mind, this is one of the greatest two, two words in Scripture. Look at the solution to the problem of our deadness. And it doesn't come from us. We were dead, not sick. We were dead in trespasses and sins. But look at verse 4. But God. I have read these verses all my life. I have heard these verses preached all my life. Many preachers out here today, they preach this text so many times, we, we've memorized these words. I never fail to have tears when I see those two words. But God. Does that strike your heart? Do you get it? But God, here we, we are in this hard, terrible state of no hope for eternal happiness and joy, and God did something. First, Paul describes the attributes of God that he expressed in what he has done. God, being rich in mercy, being rich in mercy, What prompted God's mercy? What was it that caused God to be merciful towards those who had nothing but condemnation and disdain for him? Who hated him? Who were living in that lost condition? What prompted God to have that mercy? And Paul tells us, and don't miss the context here, even when we were dead in our trespasses, there's the context, then there's nothing lovable about us. We were, as Paul described us, do you realize what this means? God didn't wait until we were good enough to be loved by him. He didn't look upon our works and see that we were deserving. He loved his people while they were still dead and in their trespasses and sins. He loved us as we were, dead in transgressions against him and dead in sins against him. Because of that love, he did something in the middle of verse 5. He made us alive together with Christ. And Paul adds a little parenthetical point here that he's going to enlarge upon in a few verses. By grace, you have been saved. We will come back to that. Paul points out three things that God has done for us in Christ Jesus. Never lose that point. Everything that God has done, he has done through his son, Christ Jesus. The Gospel of John tells us that even as he created the world, he was creating the world through Christ, the second person of the divine trinity. 
But he points out three things that God has done for us in Christ. One, he has made us alive together with Christ. Two, he has raised us up with him. And three, he has seated us with him in the heavenly places. And every one of those things are either with Christ or in Christ. Now think about this. If you're a Christian, just think about this. There is a, 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 some points we need to make here. But first, Paul uses the present tense. It is, it is what, Paul, what God is, is doing. You know, here he's, he's talking about how we are now in Christ. He didn't say he will make us alive together in Christ. He said he made us alive together in Christ. didn't say he will raise us up with him. He said he raised us up with him. He didn't seat us with him in the heavenly places. He didn't say he will do that. Paul is talking like it's already done. There is a sense in which this has already happened to us. Jackson had a favorite saying. He said, everything that's happened to Jesus is what's happened to his, his people. We've been crucified with him. We've been raised with him. We've been seated in heavenly places with him. All of these things, believers in Christ are sharing in some sense. Right now, Barbara and Jackson are sharing it fully. Fully, clearly, unobscured vision. No darkness there. No sin, no tears, no sorrow, no regrets. Nothing but joy and rejoicing and seeing Jesus Christ full on, full orbed God and man. There is a sense in which we're there, but we won't until we die. If we die in Christ, go to be with them and experience the same things. The second thing to notice Here's that all this is done, as I said, enter with Christ. Then Paul gives us God's reason for doing this. Verse 7. This is how we know that Paul is giving reasons because he starts off with so that. That's his connective phrase here. But look what he says. So that in the coming ages, now the Greek word here is the word, right, is the base word is Ionase, and it means if you want to think of it in English, think of it as eons, ages. In the coming ages, this is why God's doing this, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. In heaven there will be an eternity of seeing, experiencing, and rejoicing in the riches of God's grace in Christ Jesus. The Boyettes have just begun their journey. And it's one that will last throughout eternity with no end. Now, have you noticed something about Paul here? He hasn't mentioned one thing that we have to do in order to get to that place. Has he? In verse 8, Paul explains even more closely why that is. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. By grace are you saved through faith, and that, the King James Version says, not of yourselves. So the salvation and the grace and the faith are all a gift. They're all gift. We didn't earn any of them. Now, grace is generally defined as unmerited favor. That means it can't be bought. It can't be earned. It's freely given. Paul wants to make sure that we understand, however, so he emphasized that it is not by our works. The reason is not that by any of our works is so that God may have the glory here and Jesus Christ may have the glory here. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit will be glorified. If there were something we could do, we would be inclined to boast in ourselves. We would want to say, look, God, look what I did for you. See how much I deserve your, your honor and your love and your grace. That's our inclination, brothers and sisters. That's the way we think and that's the way we would do and that's what we would want to do. Now, if, if you are inclined to think that there's something that you can do that will make you right with God, then let me tell you what you've got to do. You've got to find a work that is equal to or better than the life and the crucifixion and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, whatever work you can find that defeats that, then you go, go after it. And there has to be sinlessness as well. 
And if you're already born, you're too late. Now, to emphasize and repeat, let me say this to you, that this gift is ours by grace. But it was bought at a great price. It was obtained for us at a great price. Jesus himself paid the price for our salvation in his life, his obedience, and his cross. That's the price. Dietrich Bonhoeffer called this costly grace, if I recall correctly. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians, you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Now someone may be asking, aren't we supposed to, be, to do something? Aren't we supposed to choose Christ? Aren't we supposed to believe, to commit ourselves to him and all that? The answer is yes, we must believe, we must commit ourselves to Jesus. Faith is indeed a gift, but it is also an act on our part. None of that is denied. Our questioner might then ask, well, aren't we missing something here? Do you remember when I reported that Jackson used to say God changes our chooser? It is the grace, the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and in our mind that enables us to see our need and to understand our plight and to flee as fast as we can to Jesus. What God does is he gives us a new heart and a new mind and we no longer want to live in that old way that we are now living in our new freedom in Christ from the things that bound us in the old life. It is grace ministered to us by the Holy Spirit that enables us to fall on our knees before him and that beg his forgiveness and to see his love so that Paul, elo that Paul so eloquently described. But look at verse 10 and there you'll see it. For, that's a good word indicating the conclusion is coming. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works there's your works. We have to do them. Which God prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. We are God's workmanship. He has already set out the path for us to walk and works for us to do in Christ Jesus. Now how do we understand this? Let me use Jackson and Barbara as an example. When God spoke to Jackson's heart in 1956 at First Baptist Church of Junction, Texas, he was nine years old. Little did he know what God had in store for him. And when he first saw Barbara in an English literature class at the University of Texas, he was dating another girl and was pretty serious, as we understand. Little did they know what God had in store for them. When they came to understand the doctrines that God inspired the Apostle Paul to write that we're looking at today, little did they know how their lives were going to change. And little did they know when an old hippie asked Jackson to start a Bible study that a ministry would start that would impact people across the world. We have gotten messages from the Netherlands, from South Africa, from Papua New Guinea, from India, from China, and I don't even know where all else. Our little church and our pastor, through his ministry and ours jointly with him, have touched the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can you see the purpose of God here in their lives? Can you see how he may be calling you even as I speak, saying to your heart, come home? Come to me, believe in me, as I have great things in store for you? Little do we know, perhaps you are a believer, but you just kind of lost track and lost ground. Do you remember the light and the joy when you first believed? Come back. Little did I know when I first met Barbara and Jackson on that paddle wheel boat in Town Lake in 1973 that someday I would be here at the end of a 30-year-plus friendship doing what Jackson loved, though with much less ability on my part, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have been asked more than once by some day springers, what are we going to do? I don't know what we're going to do, 
but I will tell you what we should, nay, must do. It is embedded in what Jackson told me. Don't let them forget the gospel. If we want to survive as a body of believers, here's what we will do. We will continue to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We will preach it here. We will preach it in our missionaries. We will preach it on television, on DVDs, and in the street, and in our homes, and in our church building. Those are our marching orders. Preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to a dying world. For it is the only hope that we or they have. There's a passage in Acts 18, 9 through 10. I love the old King James Version best here. Paul was going to Corinth. Corinth was a large and rather wicked city in that day, and the Jews had turned against Paul, and he declared to them that he was from henceforth going to the Gentiles. There were some converts, but perhaps Paul was getting discouraged. I mean, Paul went through a lot of things. But then here's what he writes in 1 Corinthians. Then spake, I mean in Acts, then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision be not afraid but speak and hold not thy peace for I am with thee and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee for I have much people in this city what is God saying he says I know you're discouraged Paul I know things aren't going well but preach Paul speak Paul why did he say that I have much people in this city Paul and I'm sending you out there to go get them And so that is our job. It's our primary job. Our fellowship is wonderful and necessary and we love it. Our traditions are precious to us and of long standing, but our main reason for existing as a church is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Without that, the rest doesn't matter very much. Now, there are many ways of doing that. We have had a great example. The Lord gave them to us for a while The Lord has taken them away. Now it's our turn to become examples to the next generations, praying that the Lord will also raise up among them those who will continue to preach this precious, eternal, soul-saving, life-changing, mind-cleansing gospel of God showered upon us in Jesus Christ, our Lord. To him be all glory forever and ever and ever. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. 